That's uh, quite a tough panel to follow, right? Do you agree? So <laughs> I promise we won't bore you. It's going to be a fantastic panel, and I'd like to um, just say a few words. My name is Suzanne Remke. When I'm not on stage at DLD, I run Hubert Berta Media's New York office and write as a US correspondent for Focus magazine. And today, I would like to welcome the two panelists to the Ashoka Health Innovation Panel. First up is Sam uh, Tugu, founder of Changamka MicroHealth, who hails all the way from Kenya. Sam? <laughs> Have a seat, Sam. And uh, second is Matthias Fuchs for, from uh, Böhringer Ingelheim. He's the head of innovation there. Yes, okay. Oh, that's fine. Great to have you too. So we will be talking about health innovation with the help of social entrepreneurs. Um, but to start out with, I would like to ask you two to introduce yourselves really quick. Um, Sam, let's start with you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sam Agutu. I'm the founder, co-founder, and uh, CEO of Changamka MicroHealth. We are uh, a social enterprise. Um, our main you know, area of operation is um, using uh, digital uh, innovations for inclusion into health financing and health distribu distribution of healthcare you know, uh, services. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Great. Thanks yeah. for coming yeah. so far. Yeah. Matthias. So my name is Matthias. I'm originally a physician by training, but uh, then life suddenly changed. I had an accident. And normally I would be in private practice somewhere, but then uh, I did research, joint industry, and uh, my company realized they can't, me, can't put me in a, into a normal business function because I got too many uh, weird ideas. And uh, that's why they thought, let's, let's have him work with social entrepreneurs and see what comes out of it. And uh, there he can't do uh, much harm. That seems like a perfect fit. <laughs> um, let's start with you, Sam. Sam, your goal is to give low- and middle-income earners in Kenya access to health insurance. In order to understand what Sam is doing, we have to um, get the basics about Kenya. Kenya has roughly 45 million people. How many have health insurance in Kenya? Yeah, well, um, yeah, just a, a bit of a perspective on Kenya. I mean, we have... Uh, a, a population of about 45 million. Out of those, um, more than 80% do not have any form of health insurance. And just a perspective also on the country, uh, the infant mortality rate is something like about you know, 40, to, you know, 40 children to 1,000. Maternal mortality rates are very high, 488 for every 100,000. 100, um, so, um, in, in that perspective, you know, the health indicators are not very good. But the one thing about Kenya that makes it uh, rank on top of the world, apart from our athletes, um, is that you know, Kenya has the highest concentration of mobile, you know, um, you know, I mean, mo mobile technology uh, in the world. Um, about 80 or 90 percent of the population have and access to a mobile phone. And you know, the rate of mobile money usage uh, is such that the number of transactions that go through mobile money is more than 50% of the country's GDP. Uh, there's something like about $30 million worth of transactions going through the country every day. Right? And therefore, you know, that then you know, changes the picture significantly and gives the opportunity for the sort of business models that we have developed. So before you became a social entrepreneur, you were working in the healthcare industry. No, in the, in the insurance industry. In the insurance industry. And yeah. then you suddenly had this big epiphany. There's a problem there. I want to do something. How did that work? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, originally, 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 very originally, I was an accountant, <laughs> right? An auditor, actually. Uh, but I worked a lot in the insurance industry, um, and um, you know, more mainly into, into health, uh, you know, in, in health insurance. 
but you know, there were a number of um, you know, challenges that um, I saw um, as, as, you know, from where I was sitting. But a number of these were also accelerated by the fact that you know, my, own, my own sister you know, died in childbirth. And uh, we realized that you know, uh, one of the biggest problems there was one of health financing, uh, that people don't have access to, to, um, to insurance or to um, uh, you know, the finances that are necessary for them to access the level of care that, 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 uh, that they deserve. And therefore, together with you know, some friends, we figured out that we had to find you know, um, solutions. And that's really you know, where it all started. Right. Yeah. So the, the problem in Kenya is that you can only get traditional health insurance when you're fully employed in a full-time job with a regular employer, and the part of the health insurance, the, the money, is taken out of your paycheck. And the health insurers there, they couldn't just come up with a different model because traditionally that's what they did. So you came up with a different model and used technology for that model. That's right, yes. I mean, the, um, there are over 40 insurance companies you know, in, in, in Kenya. And out of those, um, the, and from a population of 40 million, 45 million, only about 1.5 two million are covered by private insurers. Then they, uh, there's a government insurance, uh, but it has, over the last 50 or so years, only concentrated on those in employment, because it's mandatory for those in employment to buy insurance for their, for their staff. So for the rest of the country, <clears throat> you know, one has to then figure out you know, what to buy. But the price point is very, very high, and the sort of distribution models that are used using insurance brokers or uh, insurance agents is a sort of model that cannot possibly reach you know, the, the, the mass, the, 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 you know, the people in the villages, in the you know, informal sector. And therefore, what we did was to develop, um, use the mobile uh, phone, as it were, given that a lot of people Almost everybody you know, has access to and uses the mobile phone for communication, for voice, for SMS, for all uh, banking, transactions, right? and for banking. Mm -hmm. We realized that that needed to be used as the medium for, for inclusion into insurance. And therefore, we developed a platform. Uh, the platform is a cloud-based you know, uh, platform that then links you know, payers, like insurance companies, uh, donors, uh, providers, like in um, you know, hospitals, um, and, the, the, um, and, the, and individuals. So it is integrated to the mobile phone network so that an individual is able to actually self-register and apply and pay for their insurance through either a savings plan or they make a payment directly from their mobile phone to buy insurance. So with this, we have then you know, um, had to you know, have a number of partners to be able to actualize this. But we've realized that the only way of distributing you know, uh, products and services such as insurance is using the mobile phone, which is very ubiquitous. Great. Yeah. We'll come back to that later. We follow up on that later and jump to uh, Matthias. Matthias, you work for a traditional pharmaceutical company, one of the 20 biggest in the world, uh, based in Ingelheim, Germany. Um, what's in it for you guys? Why do you work? Why are you interested in Sam's activities and why do you work with people like Sam? I think the previous session illustrated quite well why we should work with social entrepreneurs. And Andreas Heinecke is actually one of our first Making More Health fellows in our partnership with uh, Ashoka. So working with social entrepreneurs helps us overcome our own blindness as a pharmaceutical manufacturer where we're really focused on pills. And I always use an analogy from football. In 2001, I lived in the UK. We wanted to start a football team with our sons. We had 11 guys all showing up in David Beckham jerseys. So a football team obviously can't work if you have 11 guys playing the David Beckham po position. So if you transfer that into healthcare, 
healthcare doesn't work if you have 11 companies that produce a pill for heart disease or 11 companies that build hospitals. You need a healthy mix of different skills. And the beauty of social entrepreneurs is that they really have the pulse at the needs of society, which we don't. So for them, for, for us, we learn so much from social entrepreneurs where the, really, where the pain is in healthcare, and it helps us to establish together, that's what we call co-creation, ecosystems of healthcare that improve not only availability of healthcare, but also using Sam's example of affordability of healthcare by introducing an affordable insurance scheme. So um, how many Ashoka fellows are you currently working with? Well, it's not about quantity. We have, I think currently we have about 75 Making More Health fellows, which, which also are Ashoka fellows. We also work with other fellows with other social entrepreneurs who may not necessarily be Ashoka fellows nor making more health fellows. But we really, what we are looking at is to have a broad spectrum of different solutions. And that covers really, I mean, using Andreas Heinecke, disability, it goes into mental health, which plays a, a huge role, but also primary health care. We're working with uh, an American girl, American lady who's uh, building micro hospitals in the informal settlements in Nairobi where she reaches with one little clinic six square meters large. She reaches a population of 100,000 uh, uh, individuals. So really making a social, a, a big impact on healthcare. So we have a, a broad range uh, up to people who uh, introduce micro insurance to us where we have no clue about. So let's go back to you. That was a great <laughs> transition back to Sam. Yeah. Um, Sam, technology is one part that you're using for your project in, in Kenya, but we talked yesterday, and apparently in the Kenyan population, there is kind of a distrust in insurance in general. So you had to overcome traditional ideas that insurance are, is for dead people, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, insurance has traditionally really not been, um, well, it has not been very well understood. Um, but I think I will look at it that it's not really the mistake of the, of the customer that they've not understood it. It has not been very well disseminated or explained. Um, and the sort of insurance products that have been in the market are, okay, you know, property insurance for cars or for buildings, factories. But also uh, the, the, the biggest you know, product that has been sold to individuals is life insurance. And life insurance has been sold as something that you know, benefits you when you die. You know, that you die and therefore somebody will get money. And that sort of thing is not very appealing to a, a traditional consumer. Uh, and therefore, you know, uh, health insurance um, has then you know, not been sufficiently you know, well you know, um, understood either. And that is not to mean that, that, that uh, you know, the, the people don't, have, don't know or don't understand the concept. I mean, we have our own you know, traditional methods of insurance. For example, you know, um, using livestock. You, know? uh, you find that you know, somebody who has you know, 30 goats decides to you know, um, give 20, 10 of them to their relatives who live very far away right, to keep. And that means that um, you know, if there is, for example, some, 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 some disease that hits you know, the, the goats in his area, at least there are goats in other places that are kept alive. Right? And that when they do have a problem, they can then call on the goats that they have you know, sent to their relatives. Um, so, you know, the fact that, you know, people have livestock, they have land, they have other ways of mitigating risk is there. But the, the way that, you know, um, insurance you know, operates, what they see, you know, is the challenge that, you know, you make your insurance premium payments, but if you don't have a claim, then your You're premium, not you, know, you know, don't get, get anything. Mm -hmm. And therefore, pa what our task is to try and use the traditional methods of how people conceptualize insurance and try and educate them 
using those as examples. So uh, let me just jump in here. Yeah. You guys started out with um, a healthcare account, a healthcare savings account. That's a very unusual model for all the Germans here in the in the audience. It's a very common model for Americans like me who live in the United States. Um, a healthcare account is where you put in in, in the U.S. pre-tax money, and then you can use it for uh, doctors' appointments and things like that. So that's that's very similar. But and that was much more easier. The concept of a health savings account. That's how you started, right? Yes. So we started off with the health, you know, um, savings, where an individual would use money from their, you know, um, th their mobile account, which is called M-Pesa. They would use that to load, uh, you know, a, an account, you know, a prepaid card. So, you know, the money, you know, as it is, is the credits are sitting in their card. Uh, we subsequently de modified that so that one actually has um, a virtual account on their phone. So you can actually you know, transfer money from your regular mobile money account to the health savings account, which, and, and the money in your health savings account cannot be used unless you use it for healthcare. All right, and so you know that was very well you know uh, understood. But we always had this challenge of people wanting to withdraw money from their health account for some other you know um, you know issues, and so this is where a lot of the education comes. Uh, however, you know um, we had a, a, a dedicated savings for maternity. Now that had a very high success rate because you know a woman who gets pregnant and knows that they're going to deliver in six or seven months and you give them that goal, we found that a lot of the women were able to load money and save. And you know, um, with due respect to the men, um, a lot of the women uh, um, said that part of their biggest problem was that their husbands were the biggest predators to their savings. Uh, so with this, you know, the money could only be used in a hospital. So unless the husband was going to deliver himself, he couldn't possibly <laughs> use, use the money. So um, that savings plan then helped us to inculcate this culture. But it is from there that we then moved on and said, look, there are times that your savings might not be sufficient to meet a catastrophe. And therefore, you save and your savings then transform at some point into an insurance premium. And so that what you save, you then get much more than what you have saved. And the fact that you're able to benefit five or 10 times more than what you have saved enables you to then start thinking, oh yes, if I do that, then if a catastrophe comes, then I will not be exposed. And for that, we're telling you, that because you're a big group, right, then you are actually supporting each other. Now, we, in Kenya, we have um, uh, a system called Harambe, which is that whenever you have a problem, people come together and they put money together for you. So we're saying, using this Harambe idea, yeah, let us all sort of put in a little premium, and then at the end of it all, if any one of us had a, has a catastrophe, then you get you know, uh, your, your, your payment. And you don't then expect to get something back. Great. Yeah. So Matthias, why were you guys interested in Kenya in the first place and in SAM? Well, we, we've come a long way. Um, and I, I think I need to give you some background about the Making More Health initiative because originally it started with uh, as a purely philanthropic idea. We wanted to support social entrepreneurs without actually doing something specifically with them. The second phase then w w was when we saw, well, I think we can learn a lot from social entrepreneurs in terms of leadership development. And we developed leadership development programs for our future leaders in the company. And then the third step, where Ashoka really helped us a lot, was building business models, sustainable and scalable business models together with social entrepreneurs. Why Kenya? There are, there are a variety of reasons. And I think Sam mentioned uh, at least one of them. Kenya is the number one market for mobile digital payment. That was a key reason. We have a critical mass of social entrepreneurs in Kenya. The Kenyan market is, let's say, pretty 
overseeable. It's also the language-wise, language uh, it made a lot of sense for us, and also it fits strategically into, uh, into our uh, Africa strategy. Moreover, you are probably aware that there are two insurance companies based, two large insurance companies based here in this city. One of them working closely with uh, Sam and obviously... Do we want to name them or not? Well, there's Allianz and Munich Re and we're talking okay. to both of them, but the interesting thing is that these companies who are also very boring traditional German companies, that they both have a shared interest in working with social entrepreneurs. And that is really the beauty that we're, we're, this co-creation goes beyond working with social entrepreneurs, but we're bringing other players to the table who have very different skills, which we're lacking. Very good. How is it to work with such a big company? You, you, you know, you'd think, oh my God, it, it, the decision process takes forever and it has to go through 10 steps and there's nothing, I'm getting nothing out of it for months and months and months. So be honest, how is it? It, it is tough. <laughs> <laughs> it is tough. Well, you know, um, first of all, at the, you know, at the local level, you know, our, we work with Safaricom and Safaricom is the largest mobile network operator in, 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 in the East African region. You know, it has uh, about 85% of the, of the market. And therefore, you know, it's decision making, it's their timelines and priorities are completely, you know, a lot of the time at variance with, with, with our own. Um, you know, Boringer Engelheim, another large company, but there is one common thing that we've learned you know, uh, over the last couple of years, that you must cultivate or develop or uh, have a champion yeah, within that organization. And you know, it, it's really a great idea, a, a great thing to have somebody like uh, you know, uh, Matthias. So that within all the bureaucracy, there is one per pa uh, person who is passionate and who is committed to the relationship. We've had, you know, uh, within Safaricom, a similar thing. Within, you know, uh, the other organizations, Munich, you know, really Munich Help, yeah? So um, there has to be a certain, you know, pers personal connection, you know, to people in the organization who, to whom you can feed your ideas, who can see your vision, and they, you then rely on them to take that along the various, you know, uh, bureaucratic, you know, steps within the organization. So that has helped significantly. So in startup language, um, the startup kids often use, we'll throw a bomb in there and then make it happen. Is that kind of your role, to throw a bomb in there and...? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase it uh, that way. I mean, the, the way I see it, that first of all, it's the innovativeness of the idea. Um, it's the speed with which social entrepreneurs act. They have a high level of resilience and they have no decision bodies because they can decide for themselves. Our biggest hurdle in a large company are the numerous levels of decision bodies you have. And the beauty of our Making More Health initiative that we have just one decision body which allows us to act fast. So we have learned quite a lot in terms of becoming more efficient internally and really making things happen. Because if, if, we, if we were to develop an insurance scheme, it would take us 10 years. With Sam, it hopefully will take us a couple of months to uh, really establish it and build something underneath it. It's not only about the insurance, it's really about a customer, a patient-centric holistic solution and an ecosystem. That kind of leads into my next question. What's the time frame for your project? Do you have a time frame that you say, in X years, I want to have Y number of million people insured or What's your, what are your goals? Right, yes, there, there are you know, um, time frames, but uh, what we've also learned is to have very, very flexible time frames because um, you know, the, uh, as I said, the delivery of the final you know, outcome you know, is dependent on a lot of other you know, organizations. Um, but uh, what we did is we started off, uh, we, we launched our first sort of prototype product in 2014. Um, and within about two years, you know, we had something like about 60,000, you know, lives covered, which, you know, was good by our, you know, standards. We now are looking at having about 300,000 lives covered within 24 months. 
um, and this is because we've made some tweaks on the technology. We have, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, we've improved the number of, uh, you know, and increased the number of partners that we have. And given that uh, the whole insurance, you know, uh, industry in Kenya, uh, the private insurers have managed to cover only 1.2 million people in, in 50 years. I think getting 300,000 in two years, and if we can go on that trajectory, then hopefully within five years, we would really be a major, if not the you know, largest player uh, in the health insurance you know, sector in Kenya. I think that deserves yeah. an applause. So going back to you, Matthias, um, this seems to be a really huge task you guys have taken on. Do you want, do you need partners in the industry, in a similar industry, in insurance? Uh, we obviously need partners because, I mean, uh, <laughs> if we really want to make uh, healthcare available to the 65 or 70 percent of the world population who currently have limited, if any, access. I think that is a huge task which we can't accomplish with partners. And we have to be realistic to start small. I mean, we don't, we don't, it's impossible to establish something uh, within a short time frame globally. And that's why we think uh, to start in Kenya is, is a great place to start. I like the idea that we have a strong digital partner, which is a telecom company, which is probably the most innovative telecom company uh, with uh, a mobile network and a mobile payment network. We have an insurance partner. We have a couple of local partners. At some point, we probably need to talk to governments. Uh, you yes. already yeah. alerted me that that yeah. may pose some risks, but without partners, it won't work. I mean, we need the buy-in from, from all the respective decision makers uh, in the entire ecosystem. Do you have anyone in mind? This is the time to say it in public. Who do you want in the boat? Well, I'd, I'd, love, uh, I'd love to have, I think that uh, Triumvirate, uh, the, the, this working together with a large insurance companies, either one of the two Munich companies is fine for me, uh, with a large telecom provider and ourselves as an emerging healthcare provider because we want to evolve from a pure pharmaceutical company into a healthcare company offering more holistic solutions, patient-centric solutions. I think that, that is my vision that these three, I think if we have a bank on top, even better, but I think that would suffice already to build sustainable and scalable solutions. Great. Sam, when I read your CV, I was wondering, a social entrepreneur, is he or she being born, or is he or she being made at some point? Well, um, both. <laughs> <laughs> They're born. Um, actually, I would say that you know the social entrepreneur is is, is made um, in that um, you know several years ago when I left university, I didn't have any idea that I would actually be a social entrepreneur, I must admit. But you find that uh, you know, with emerging you know, trends, with emerging you know, demographic you know, uh, uh, you know, changes, economic challenges, but more so with emerging opportunities, you know, uh, one who is alert to these changes and who would want to make a difference, you then find that you're able to to, to, to develop, you know, ideas which can be commercialized. So, uh, you know, um, I think that, you know, a lot of, you know, um, the, that the entrepreneurial space is available, but it is there for the taking. So it's, you know, for the individuals to actually identify these opportunities and see how to commercialize and to scale them. So, um, you know, um, our own Kenyan, you know, space you know, um, is very fertile in that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, entrepreneurship and a lot of innovation. There are innovation labs now, and that that also helps to, to, to germinate, you know, um, ideas. So I think, you know, it is important to have, you know, a fertile environment that can be able to support, you know, uh, innovation. Matthias, last um, one. Yeah, I thought about partners, and there's, I mean, I heard Hildegard Wortmann yesterday on stage, we'd love to have a mobility partner. It must Hello, be, it BMW, should... anybody here? <laughs> because there's so much you can do with mobility, because without mobility, particularly in a country like Kenya, nothing works. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, we will connect them. Cool. DLD's motto is connect the unexpected. The time is running out, so we have to wrap this up. I'm very, very humbled to be with these two gentlemen here on stage who are really changing a part of the world and who are making millions of lives in Africa better ones. Thank you so much. Thank you.